Maybe we move in and we don't hear the intonation for a few days. Maybe we hear it as soon as we unlock the door. Maybe we drag our friends and family into the house and ask them to hear it. And they look into the distance and listen as we try to describe it and fail. You don't hear it. It's like a mouth harp, deep twang, like throat singing, ancient, glottal, resonant, husky and rasping, but underwater. Alone in the house, though, we become less aware of it, like a persistent, dull headache, deaf to the sound until the still silence of ownership settles over us. Maybe we decide we will try to like the noise. Maybe we find comfort in it. Maybe an idea insists itself more easily than an action. Maybe we make eye contact with the elderly neighbor next door. He watches through his window. The moving truck pulls up. We freeze on that odd instant. Maybe Julie's foot breaks through a plank on the front porch when she steps outside to phone her father to let him know we've arrived safely. Maybe the board breaks months later while we're enjoying the weather with a glass of lemonade. Maybe we fix it right away. Maybe we ignore it for a few months. Maybe we try to convince ourselves that we should get settled before worrying about any repairs. Maybe I make one of the hidden basement rooms into my dark room. Maybe I start taking photographs of everything, of the stain on the wall and of Julie putting away the mismatched dishes in the cupboard and of the neighbor emerging onto his front porch and retreating almost immediately. Maybe the neighborhood children ring the doorbell. Maybe it's some faulty wiring. Maybe the faint chiming is something else entirely, a thing we will only recognize later. Maybe something as simple as a doorbell deserves our dread occasionally. Maybe we're foolish to stay calm for as long as we do. Maybe I hear a sound and Julie doesn't. Maybe sometimes Julie cocks her ear and says, what was that? And I haven't heard a thing. Maybe it's possible to become deaf to something, to block it out. Maybe it's not there for both of us to hear at the same time. Maybe we should remember our fear of the undercurrent when we go to the beach. Maybe we should stay inside and tell each other stories that are further from the truth. Maybe we should share something genuine for once, stories from the deep, honest pits of us. But what if those buried, fetid stories are the ones that have bubbled to the surface? What if they're right there, balanced on the edge of our teeth, ready to trip into the world without even our permission? And chapter one comes from Julie. The real estate agent with his waxy hair and perma smile keeps stopping to listen, waving his hand saying, that's just the house settling. We think the house seems more than settled and wonder why he's calling so much attention to the sound and look at the handsome dark wood trim and how many closets are hidden within closets and we stare out the picture window at the woods butted up against the backyard and we probably wouldn't have heard a thing if he hadn't mentioned it. But we do hear a noise and now that we're listening it is unsettling how much it sounds like moaning but not the bellow of someone in pain, more like an incantation, some sort of ritual snarl. So we look at each bedroom carefully, hoping to be proven wrong about this place, hoping to find something that convinces us the house is not in fact exactly what we've been seeking. And we ask the agent if we have to worry about crime living so near the woods, and he explains that the woods are bounded on the other side by a beach, and there is nothing to be afraid of but waves. And we smile politely, but in our minds we think a wave can overwhelm and a wave can take away. We snag on that, but the agent barrels forward, hustling us to the unfinished basement and pretending not to hear the sound in an obvious way. And he disappears around a corner and we follow him, only to find him gone. James and I look at each other, concerned, until a section of the wall spins around and there stands the agent, face plain, matter of fact, saying, secret compartments. There are several of them in this room alone. He emerges and squats down, lifting up a three by three section of flooring to reveal a small finished crawl space below us, an empty concrete cube, and he reaches above his head and punches up a drop tile to expose another pocket above, lit well, plaster painted a clean pale blue. And then I reach high above my head trying to push against other tiles, but they all stick firmly in place. Why, I ask. Well, the previous owner seems to have been a bit of a homebody, he says. We're not sure of the original purpose of the rooms, but they do make for a ton of extra storage space. 
I squeeze James's hand and he squeezes back because we have this way of feeling the same about the unexpected. And I know, like me, he is excited about the secret passages, this being one of the places where we are seen together, just one instance where we twist in the same spot, mirroring each other and meshing at once. A stain stammers on one of the walls, a wet grayish blotch like new paper mache edged in black. And I ask the agent about it, and he says water damage from a leak at the top of the foundation, but it's been fixed. Another crush of our hands together, and we wind our way back up the stairs. The agent asks what we think, and we don't actually need time to decide, but James is doing a great job of remembering my instructions. We will not act too eager. We will hide our excitement until we are alone and can take our time to discuss with reason and measure. We'll think about it, I say, but we'll let you know soon. We know how quickly a place like this can disappear. Ah, yes, of course, the agent says. No rush, you've got my number. In the car, James says, I don't think that house is going anywhere. No rush? That's unusual in real estate, right? Especially when it's so cheap. People should be crawling all over each other to get this place. I know foreclosures can take some time, but no rush? That seemed weird. I had the same thought. I say we make an offer right away, but we lowball it. You're speaking my language, he says. Underestimation is my middle name. I tell myself not to discredit my husband's ability to predict the odds, that I'm trusting my own instinct, not his. I tell myself we can win even if he agrees with me. Uh, so they buy the house uh, and they move in and um, you know uh, they, they have this neighbor that's sort of uh, keeping a close eye on them. Uh, they both get a job in town. Uh, Julie with, uh, with someone who she went to college with so she kind of has a lifeline. Uh, but James is, uh, is trying to make some new friends. So this chapter is from James. Uh, skipping ahead to chapter six. I grab a beer with my coworker Sam on my way home from work. He's not a friend I would pick on my own. In the economy of work compatriots, though, he will do. We drive separately to the bar closest to the industrial park that our office hides inside. Stellar to have you on board, man. Right after I got hired, they appointed a female CEO, and she's hired only women since. I thought I was going to have to file a discrimination suit. Where are my bros at, you know? I mean, the office has some nice scenery now, but I want someone to enjoy it with. He chucks my arm a little too hard. I battle with whether I'll share his worldview with Julie when I get home. Is the commiseration worth turning her against my one friend in this town? We take turns buying around each, and then Sam says he has to get home to watch the game. I compliment his choice of teams. They're doing well this season, and I'd have bet on them if I hadn't promised Julie I'd stop. He high-fives me and punches my arm again. I will myself not to flinch. Sam checks his reflection in a Bud Light mirror. He pinches his goatee to no noticeable effect and straightens the collar of his polo. Later, man, hasta mañana. He heads for the door. I order one more. The old bartender who's been silent until now tells me my face is new. Where are you from, he says, without much interest. He reaches across the bar to wipe down the area where Sam had been sitting. I notice the wrong way the last joints of his fingers bend. We're from the city. We moved into that big house at the end of Stillwater. He looks up sharply. Then to Stillwater, you say? With the wraparound porch, yeah. Well, they've all got wraparound porches over there, so you're not helping me much, but you're saying the last one before the woods, is that right? That's the one. I take a sip. Why? I know a bit about that house, do you? I pause. I know I live there. What else is there to know? A family lived in that house for a long time. Parents and a handful of kids, little slices of people they were, pale, fuzzy. But what about them? He runs his thumb inside the waistline of his jeans, inching up the flesh of his belly behind his thin t-shirt and then letting it fall. While the boy child was seen so little, people wondered if he was real, shined like a shaded bulb, if you know what I mean. Now the, girl I knew, now the girl I knew a bit because my buddy dated her back in high school. She had troubles. My friend was never allowed in the house, but he was enamored for a short while until her father told him not to come near her anymore. I asked the bartender for more pretzels. 
He refills the bowl with a warning. Careful, those suckers will only make you thirstier, and then you'll be wobbling your car home like the road is a tightrope. No reason to reveal the trade secrets. I'll take a glass of water, too, I say. The bartender fills a pint glass for me. Now, the girl had a habit. When they were out, she'd keep scribbling in a notebook or on a napkin or any little scrap of paper she could dig up. My buddy said he didn't even think she knew what she was writing most of the time. She'd fill up a piece of paper and then flip it around, start writing the other way, layers. He said he wondered if she was listening to him when he talked, but she could carry on a full conversation while she wrote. I'd say he was a little relieved when her father forbade him from coming around. He wanted to understand it, and he was getting the idea he couldn't. So what happened to her? I catch sight of the clock in the mirror behind the bar. I realize I should get going. Oh, she ran away from home not long after that. Her parents died, and then the state tried to track her down but couldn't, so they ended up putting the house on the market. I ask for my tab. I thank him. I'll be back in case you think of any more stories. The bartender looks at me as if I've misunderstood. I drive on the four-lane highway until the heavy trees thin and side streets offer themselves. I look for kids running around after dinner. I hunt for the lights of TVs and windows, but still the neighborhood is silent. It's later than I think, I tell myself. You wanted quiet. This is what you wanted. Uh, and this is back to Julie. Chapter 11. I sit on the lawn in the backyard, pulling the thick, multi-fingered spirals of weeds out with all my might. I thrill when I succeed in uprooting the thick plug of a base from the ground. My back aches, and I take a break. Wide gaps of dirt populate the area between the patches of grass where the weeds once were. I'll need to add a bag of seed to the list of items to acquire on my next trip into town. I hear what I think is a flock of birds at the forest's edge, but when I look up into the trees, I see a couple of children arranged high in the branches and assume there are more I can't see farther in based on the volume of their cries. These must be the children James mentioned. I try to pick out what they're calling to each other, but I can't flip their sounds from chirps to language. I finger the soil, scraping and packing until it's fresh and loose, and I begin to work my fingers into the earth, get my hands buried deep enough that my wrists feel the cool soil, and let them stay there, feeling fixed in place, grounded until the chill resolves, and my hands have warmed the earth around them, and I feel the dirt go to mud, and it takes a huge effort to pull them up. And the first thing I think when I see them is that these aren't my hands. These are different hands from the ones I dug into the ground. These fingers look longer now, and these palms open wider. I stare up at the sun until the light burns my eyes, and I close them, pull my dirty hands to my face to find some darkness. When my sight recovers and I let the light back in, everything looks clearer. My hands are my own again, and I can see veins in my legs that are closer to the surface than they'd been before. The grass looks sharper and the dirt is clumped in pillowy mounds around the holes I'd cleaved, and I feel a face right in front of my own. But I am alone, and I know that if I am not alone, it is just some other version of myself that is nearby. I feel breath on my cheeks, and I think of the way my hands seemed wrong, and I inhale and the air is cool and the light darkens, and I look for a cloud, but I can't even find the sun because my vision is dark or blocked, and I feel a tightness around both wrists, snugger than the dirt had been. But when I pull back, I can move my arms fine, yet the pressure remains. I stumble to stand and lurch run inside, arms out, muscles taut, the door taking too long to swing shut. And I sit on my wrists on the nice pastel floral couch, trying to rid them of that feeling of compression. And my vision comes back in pinpricks as I try to remember how long I'd been outside, try to remember when I'd last eaten. I search for all of my answers in the world, return to look out the back window and memorize the empty garden and close my eyes trying to imagine I am seeing myself sitting out there, conceiving myself as both inside and outside. And then I feel lightheaded and lie down on the living room rug, pace my memory until sleep trips me and James arrives home shaking me, sure I've passed out. I wake confused and he looks at my hands and ushers me into the kitchen where he washes them gently with warm water and soap that smells like tea, scrubbing my nails. 
We are both silent, but his is an assured silence, a silence of faith that says, whatever it is, we'll figure it out, but for, no, for now, I will care for you. This quiet chimes like a bell on dampered, and I want to thank him for his understanding, for letting this ring. And so I hug him tight, my hands still wet with soap, and I bury my face in the soft flannel of his collar, and he tucks his chin over my shoulder, and I feel the scratch of his beard on my neck like Velcro holding us together. He puts me to bed, and in the morning I am full of fever, but I pull myself downstairs for water, and when I look, there are no longer smudges on the sofa and the holes where I'd buried my hands in the yard have swallowed themselves. Thanks.